I have been doing these messages. I think this is number 68 wow. for me. And I have never done one on this subject. And I'm really surprised by that because this has probably been the most crippling, the most crippling thing that I've had to deal with in my life. So it just seems crazy that I have not done anything about it. The spirit of rejection. When they talk about one that governs someone's life, this one was my strong man. It's the number one. Um, this is the biggest one for me. There were many, but this one was the one that really has been a challenge for me. And the plan of Satan is to create those early wounds in the soul. And he wants us as young as possible to feel rejected and abandoned because he knows that humans are going to compensate for those terrible feelings of rejection, which are some of the worst of feelings. We're going to develop behavior habits. And he knows when we steer away from the pain of rejection and abandonment to behaviors to help us not feel that pain, that that creates open doors and open uh, open house for demonic possession, at the least controlling oppression. Where if you are physically wounded, like if you have like a big cut on your arm, everyone knows when they see this great wound that you need to be, stop the bleeding, get them somewhere, get that stitched up. But when somebody jags your soul with um, criticism or as a child just rejection we don't even know how the way children process but nobody does anything with the soul wounds is the point the soul being different than the body is gets just terribly wounded and no one tells anybody what to do about that so especially young people but adult people also are left to themselves to try to resolve that pain and they have little to no understanding of how to do that and i was radically saved and i was probably 10 years past that when it came up about rejection so there's very little that's even said about it anywhere when it's a major crippling factor in most people's lives and these wounds they often become strongholds and the strongholds attract demons. And a stronghold, according to the Bible, is a belief pattern that has exalted itself above your knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the stronghold will cause default responses that will easily show a pattern because we're trying to cope with it. And if a spirit of rejection takes hold, it just flames feelings. So now you've got this filter that says, they're going to reject me too. They're going to reject me. Everybody's going to reject me. And so it's just constantly flaming those feelings and the lies that set that in place. So whatever it was that started that whole I'm rejected thing where someone was dismissive or whatever it was that happened that you believed something and then that set that re rejection as control. We, the lies have to be, the lies are what the devil uses to completely basically destroy us or own us by then. And they also cause a lot of irrational behavior to come up out of them. Rejection is a very serious threat to our sense of belonging and it has oftentimes very serious consequences on mental, emotional, and spiritual health, which will then result in great physical problems as well. And rejection alone is not a mental health diagnosis, but it is connected to and a very big part of several other legitimate mental illnesses, including depression, anxiety, body dysmorphic disorder, borderline personality disorder, loneliness, avoidant personality disorder, social phobia, and suicidal ideation. All of these 
legitimate mental health diagnoses have been connected to rejection. And the spirit of rejection is an oppressive spirit. It steals your joy and your peace and leaves you instead with mental pressure and distress, great distress. And the Bible says that God's love will never fail in Psalm 136. And we have got to learn to discern what we feel from what is actually true according to the Bible. And that's the entire victory over every stronghold right there. What we feel is if it's not the same as what God says in the Bible, it's going to produce an entire different system that is now run by the devil that's going to have fruit that looks like his fruit. So what we have to do is in the Bible, we have to learn the truth about this, learn it, know it. It is the only thing that is going to defeat the lie is the truth in God's word, nothing else. You can counsel and coach these spirits or rejection, fear, grief, all of them. You can counsel all day long, but it's not going to change if there's actually a spirit of rejection. You have to know the truth about God's love and your worth to him. Then you can be set free because somewhere that was disqualified. And the word of God is very powerful and active. It, it says that in the word of God, that it's very active, it's alive. And the work of the word is going to set you free from not just rejection, but all darkness. Because rejection does not travel alone. It brings in a lot of other things with it. The spirit of rejection harasses you with feelings of worthlessness. It partners with an orphan spirit to make you feel unwanted. Not just in one setting, like you feel unwanted everywhere you go. You start to question your identity in Christ and you feel rejected by God oftentimes. And it battles directly against the spirit of sonship, which is what we get from God at salvation to hold us secure in that relationship. It would be like if you, your children just did not believe that you were their parent or that you loved them or that you cared for them or that you would keep them safe. They just could not believe it. They could, could not connect to that information. They just felt like, I hear you say it, but I, it's not true. Well, that's how God feels when we operate in rejection and we completely discount every single thing that he has done from the beginning of time, especially the life of Jesus having left heaven, come here for 33 years, was destroyed his body he was murdered to pay for our sin and yet we still cling to they don't love me some signs of rejection are you feel despondent discouraged there seems to be no words of encouragement that can be said to you to help you to feel better about yourself you feel left out of conversations you feel like an observer you have a challenging time interacting just because you never feel like you're actually part of what's happening. You feel that life's opportunities have passed you by. The best opportunities for you have passed by. You've missed them. You failed at them. Something. And that it's too late to do anything about it. So basically, the best of life has gone by. And you have nothing coming but to endure until death. You feel rejected if you're not recognized for your accomplishments by those in authority. You feel the spirit of envy then settling in. You are jealous as you begin comparing your situations with other people. That feeling of jealousy and comparison then partner with rejection and tell you that your life is not fair. Other people have all these other things that are an advantage to them over yours, you do not have that. Life is not fair to you. You feel the need to prove yourself while at the same time feeling you're never going to measure up. It's never going to get better. You find yourself comparing um, when it's 
being greeted, your leadership or people that are important to you walk by and they seem to see other people, but they don't notice you. And then you feel rejected because they didn't acknowledge you or greet you the way that you were hoping. You're constantly seeking the approval of others and you suffer from people pleasing. You're un unable to pull out of that. You're easily offended or embarrassed when someone gives you correction or discipline. You always in public are trying to make yourself appear proven and worthy that you're you also feel that you're on the outside looking in during many interactions oddly you think you could do a better job than your current boss if you were allowed to try you believe that no one understands you or what you're going through and what this is if this is true about you or even some of them it's called in the bible spiritual warfare and it happens in our mind our will and our emotions and that rejection stronghold is very clever but it will never compare to the power and love of jesus christ and the price that was paid by jesus on the cross all of his blood was shed the purpose was to overcome all the power of darkness and it definitely defeats the spirit of rejection you do not have to be dragged around by rejection or abandonment or fear of all of the different the anxieties and fears that go with that social phobia that comes very strongly with that david leggy says you cannot repent of a demon repentance will not be enough to deal with the demonic force neither can you repent of a wound a demon has to be cast out and a wound must be healed and that's basically why rejection probably sits there as long as it does because you can't counsel it you can't heal it unless you involve god there's no solution to that really except god god is the only one that offers the full healing of rejection the cross meant that jesus completed the full price everything that was needed to pay for that sin to be just disqualified in your life to be its voice taken away its presence removed there's some different kinds of rejection group rejection is what apply to like church denomination political parties this is where people are actually removed from groups or groups are are not allowed so it's a it's a larger it's not isolated to one particular person personal rejection is probably one of the most painful and that's when people reject each other so men and women reject each other um people on jobs you often see they struggle with relationships there same reason rejection in itself is not sin because there's many people that we should reject so once you are submitted to christ and you're doing what god wants you to do there's going to be all kinds of people sent your way to try to take you off course and you have to be discerning and you should reject them you shouldn't try to make a deal with them you shouldn't try to negotiate with them you should reject them because they're bringing sin and compromise to your door reject them that's why rejection is not bad because there are times when it absolutely should happen and then there's times that it shouldn't but it's very painful to deal with self-rejection is very harmful self-rejection often leads to self-harm behavior people who are suicidal are self-rejecting and it can also be more mild as thinking of yourself in a negative way so people that are considered as low self-esteem they are believing what they think of themselves or what others have said to them about themselves over what god says about them so again the bible is a solution because the bible is an entire story about god saying how much we are worth to him which is everything this is all for us 
So if we choose to reject that and believe that I don't feel like I'm important and you just lock onto that, that is an ultimate act of pride actually because you're choosing to believe that you are right and God is wrong. That the creator of the universe made a flawed human, which he didn't make any mistakes. Or even if you messed up your own life, you're saying he's not able to fix it, the one who made the universe. There's another type of rejection, rejection by God. God does reject certain things and people, and it isn't because he is hard or evil, it's because he is love. An example of that is in 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23, it says, Samuel replied, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And the people of Israel had suffered while Saul was their leader because Saul did not obey God's command. Saul also set up a monument to honor himself for his victory in a war, which raised him above God. And when Samuel asked Saul, why do you not obey the Lord? Samuel lied, saying that everything he did was for God. Of course, Samuel knew that this was not true, but he was giving him an opportunity to repent. But his answer was so ridiculous, he tried to cover up his actions with religious excuses instead of admitting to his greed. Saul claimed that he had saved out the best sheep and cattle in that situation in order to sacrifice them to God, but that was a lie. He shifted blame to others, saying it was the soldiers who had saved out the best sheep and cattle. He then completely took himself out of having been part of it. So Samuel, who was a prophet, said, that's enough. And he told Saul that because he had rejected the word of the Lord, God had now rejected Saul as king over Israel. So God is certainly about giving many chances, but at some point, I remember a pastor of my church used to say, there's a fine line where God's grace ends and his wrath begins. And he says, you don't want to find that line. And I feel like I may have come really close to that because I was feeling something that was terrible, but I don't know. I would not want to know what it would be like to be under the wrath of God, but there certainly is such a thing and people do find their place there. Some forms of self-rejection are obvious. People who have self-harm behaviors. I've seen this with many different ways. Um, we have seen um, people who just, who are what we call cutters. They, they cut, they don't usually do it in a way that you're gonna see it, but it's um, self-harm. That's the most common way in what I deal with, but I also see it in people who are body mutilators. They will, um, there's a lot of that behind, if people were to understand what's behind um, excessive tattooing and, and body piercing, they would be shocked to know what's driving that behavior. And I'm not by any means passing judgment on anyone. I'm just saying that people should examine what all goes into some of those excessive, we see them where it's excessive, saved or not saved. We also allow relationships with people who treat us poorly. So people who stay in abusive relationships, they know they're abusive, they know they should leave, everyone tells them that, but they don't. That's also self-harm. And at the same time, this group will reject the people who treat them well. So the ones who are saying, we want you safe, we'll get you out of there, um, we'll do anything to help you, they reject those people to stay with the one who treats them poorly. That's self-harm behavior. And addictions are another way. Addictions are self-harm. And this isn't just drug or alcohol addiction. Um, gluttony, food, is probably one of the biggest um, as far as harm. So there are all kinds of different ways that, that addiction, even religion, it's very harmful. It becomes very harmful to those around you because people just get battered by your religion. Addictions is 
is too much of something, it's moved into idolatry and it's going to hurt you and the people around you. And to keep it when you know that it's hurting you and the people around you is a choice to self-harm. Self-rejection can also be a lot more subtle. So when we know that we are gifted and we have the abilities to go do great things for God, but we don't pursue them because instead we find this person that we want to settle in a relationship with and we know that we can't throw all of our focus at both things. So we're so um, invigorated by the relationship that we cash in the opportunities to do great things for the kingdom. That is, believe it or not, harming self. You absolutely diminish your worth. You delete your giftings. You delete your purpose. You decide on something much less and much more primal. Another is staying in relationships or jobs that are just totally dead ends. And we know many people, all of us through our whole lives, know many people who hate their jobs. They absolutely hate their jobs. And they talk about that all the time. They hate going to work. They hate going um, every day. It's never a good day at work. They hate their jobs. And they just labor and hate it and talk about it all the time. And they stay in it because it's comfortable and they know what they're doing and they don't have to learn anything else. So part of it is, I know how this works. I know what's expected of me. I'm not making mistakes because I know what I'm doing. And if I go change that up and I get something and have to grow and learn, then that's gonna be uh, too much change for me. I don't want that. So the sad part about that is, is that we are very capable of learning. We're very capable of much more if we're in that situation, any situation, we're always capable of more. And we should keep moving towards a higher purpose with God, not just for ourselves. Believe it or not, people were not created to simply earn a wage to pay their bills. That is the lowest form of how you can spend this gift that you get one time of life is to get a job and then, or switch to the job to get more money, but just to stay focused on getting the money to pay my bills. It has nothing to do with your purpose, contributing to society, it is completely fixated on where can I get the most pay with for the least amount of um, energy that I have to spend on this. It is, it is reducing yourself to something so low. And when you know you're going to meet God one day, everyone will. And he knows just how gifted he made each one of us. And then we say, but I did this for 25 years because what was I supposed to do? Move? What was I supposed to do? Quit when I didn't have another job? There's all kinds of excuses made, but we will answer for that because he made us all to have an extraordinary destiny here and purpose. Another is turning down great life opportunities because we are fearful of, well, what could happen? Um, if we fly, well, what if a plane crashes? You'd be shocked how often I hear that. Or they just don't know. These different things could happen. What if I get somewhere and I can't get back to my house? It's all kinds of just variables that are quite menial when it comes down to if you did go, though, and this amazing opportunity, you, you conquered it. I think of these girls around here who just went and, and climbed a mountain with Pam Lanhart. That's incredible. I, I just can't even imagine that happening in my lifetime but I look at that as they can tell you the exhilaration when they get there when they're at the top it's I that kind of thing is you won't know until you've done it how that feels another way to self-harm is by allowing tormenting mental habits to continue in your life such as perfectionism perfectionism is a torture rack it is a continuous torture rack and people will stay on that rack they will just stay there and they're tortured and they know they're tortured every day they're tortured they replay and replay and replay they write ahead 
They plan things that are never going to happen because their perfectionism is just driving them. But they stay. When you could get off the torture rack, there are several different ways to get help to get off that. But staying is a choice. Another is choosing instant gratification to avoid short-term discomfort. But in the process, you deny yourself what could have happened. So because you chose the shortcut, because you didn't want to do the long road, you missed out on what could have been. People are doing that all the time. There's various ways rejection can come into one's life and quite often it's really early. So most, most it was set by long before they had choices really about it. Growing up with a parent who's emotionally unavailable or very critical, um, parents who are fighting and arguing all the time, anything that's gonna cause fear in this child Rejection is going to come in because they know that they are not, they don't matter. They know they don't matter. There's nothing about that environment that's giving them value. They know that they are just there and they are running for cover. So the chaos of the home is an easy way for that to happen. Children are very sensitive to re rejection. They're, they're developing. And if a child become sensitive to rejection, they are most likely going to continue into their adulthood expecting rejection. Once that's rooted, they're going to develop around it and expect it. Children who feel bullied, whether in their home or at school, often grow up to fear rejection more than other people. Any type of exposure to painful rejection for anyone is going to cost, a, you will do whatever. We'll, we're willing to do just about anything to not re-experience that pain. So we will avoid certain groups. We will definitely avoid certain people. And if we're forced into it, we're filled with anxiety, but people don't go and try to repeat the thing that caused them to feel terrible rejection. There also is a possible genetic predisposition or certain personality types make it more likely that someone will struggle with rejection. It has been linked to low self-esteem, social anxiety, insecure attachment behaviors, aggressiveness, self-injury, social isolation, and it's often passed down the family line through neglect, selfishness, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, drug use in the home, repeated negative words and messages that are given to someone, broken marriages and families, and an inability to accept parental roles. So this is where the parent is the friend or they can't, they can't use authority in the home. Basically the child has far too much freedom, it ends up really hurting the child. They're looking for structure, and if they don't get structure, then they won't know how to develop structure in their future. It's gonna make a real mess of their life. This hunting by the spiritual realm to who they can oppress or possess, both things can happen, that is a a work done in the spirit realm. Ephesians 6 says we're not in war with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness in heavenly places. And people who struggle with rejection often feel like they need to be liked by everyone. If they're rejected, they work very hard to get that person's favor again. So if they had it with someone and then they lose it, they just, they become obsessive about trying to get it back. And this leads to more people pleasing behavior and other more drastic behaviors as it becomes a more urgent need. So if they continue to not get that need met or fixed, they will act out in more ways that are far less appropriate because they're so urgent to get that person back to liking them. It becomes, it becomes, um, 
if people really belittle themselves they really bring themselves down to a to a level that other people are really worried for them at that point people who battle feelings of rejection respond to life in ways that will protect them from that pain because that pain is so severe their fear of being rejected causes them to struggle to form new connections so they're not as socially outgoing as they would have been they also sabotage current relationships and this group is the group that constantly accuses their partner of cheating they're just always looking in their phone they're always looking for some kind of evidence just to prove what they already know that their partner's cheating whether or not they're cheating at all they're just consumed with accusing them that they're cheating and what this does is it brings the relationship to an end at some point whether it's an actual end where the person leaves them or the person just checks out they don't listen to anything else that they say they dismiss them completely emotionally from their life because they simply can't take it anymore this person who's in this pattern becomes angry and combative when they let's say text their friend and their friend doesn't text them right back or they don't text them back in the way that they thought they were going to so they baited them with something and then they thought well this will make them say this and then they don't they become very upset about texting or any other form of communication but this will cost you friendships because people can't take that level of battle all the time i'm one who is probably I know that I was that way before I was everything that this says I was that person but I also know that on this side of it when I can now see the truth about it all I can I try to bear with people for a long time because I know how powerful rejection is and I know how it makes you act but at the same time people become so aggressive and so mean and they just start messing up your life and not once do they ever stop and consider this is not how people should be acting. They don't do that. They're just consumed with making you hear them, that you're rejecting them, that you're treating them poorly. And they make it such a mess for you that you eventually have to walk away from the friendship just to survive. And then they still don't see it as something on their side. They. They could have kept many friends if they could have just not battled this thing out for so long, if they could just let things go, but they can't. They can't let it go. They're just ruminating on this all the time. And it may be true and it may not be true, but in their mind, it's true. Even if it was true, it still doesn't need to be that destructive wrecking ball to all of your relationships because people are so broken Everybody should be allowed to have bad days, make mistakes. But if you can't let that go and you can't let that happen, you're never going to have any friends because people just can't really be around you. You're too angry. Others are going to avoid situations and relationships where they might even be rejected because they can't handle the pain of rejection. So this was where I found myself before I became a Christian. So... It was a few years after I had become a Christian that someone did some prayer work with me and this issue of rejection came up. I didn't have a full understanding of it, nothing like I do now, but they did some breaking of agreements prayer or um, it's, uh, I don't remember what it was called, but anyway, they, it was a breaking of the stronghold of rejection amongst other things. And so this happened, but I didn't get better. I actually found myself more paranoid. I was, well, I was worse, actually. I, I was like, this went the opposite way of what I was told it would do. And I didn't understand why I was suddenly worse. My anxiety was way worse. So then going back and having them work with that, I actually had a fear of rejection that was out in front of rejection. So I was so afraid of being rejected that I wouldn't even get into a position to be rejected. So I was so isolated by then. 
And then in different ways, I made a lot of vows that had severed me from my own emotions in many ways. I'd had severe chronic addictions, but when the addictions were no longer in my life, I had vows that I had made that had controlled my emotions, packed them away somewhere. I didn't even know I had them still. They were completely gone to me. Um, I thought that I was a genius, but what I found out was I had really damaged myself by doing that. It's a, it's a really um, painful thing to have to work through and undo. So I would advise people not to make vows like, I will never do that again. I will never speak to her again. I will never um, go to that church again. I will, it's all these, I will never. I was absolutely cemented into a tiny room with those. And then I had a few choices. I felt I was strong and didn't feel anything, but the thing was I didn't have too many opportunities to feel anything either. I had vowed my way out of most interaction with people. This causes people to get very isolated and lonely, which they think, oh, I'm really isolated and lonely, but you completely did that to yourself. There's no one who should be lonely, really because there's so many different ways to interact with people now that if you can't leave your home, you can still interact, you know, on video calls. There, there just really isn't a reason to be lonely unless you're choosing it because there's so many different ways to reach out. Even if it's to volunteer to help people in a crisis situation or volunteer for an organization that helps, say, domestic, abuse or children or something there are many ways for you to get involved with other people in very meaningful ways cooking classes art classes there's all kinds of ways in relationships the belief system is disastrous when it comes to rejection when someone expects rejection they will never feel safe in a relationship any relationship they're always going to feel unsafe. And even if they aren't being rejected, they're always watching for that moment. They're waiting for it and they expect it and it's just going to bring itself around because any little thing, they're going to be able to turn it into, you just rejected me. They let very minor issues become accusations of you do not care for me at all. You treat me so poorly, they turn the slightest slight into this major character issue and they grow more and more distressed and angry because now they're able to point at just about everything this person does or doesn't do as judgment or rejection and so this person is now so unstable in this relationship I've been there where you don't know what to do you have become just so fearful of even talking to them because it always turns into a battle that everything becomes a battle because you just your own fear of talking to them then becomes the thing that offends them adolescent girls rank high in what will make um them a victim. If they have rejection operating in their life, they are at a much higher risk for victimization, according to a study published in Children Maltreatment. They also are more likely to go into dangerous lengths to keep a relationship when they feel insecure about a boyfriend's commitment. They know that the choices they're making are gonna hurt them, but they will still do that because they just need to keep the relationship. And they also are more likely to stay in relationships that involve battering, verbal abuse. They tolerate nearly anything to stay together. And then they find it so unbelievable that they've got this relationship where people like him, people like her, but nobody knows that he's beating her up and they're too ashamed to speak about it, so they stay in it. Adults are very similar. They do many of the same things and they often misinterpret events and reactions from others because they're hyper vigilant to being rejected. Then comes all the accusations. They have this irrational jealousy oftentimes because they're terrified of being abandoned or rejected. They become tormented and then they torment their partner 
over sometimes something as simple as going to work he took a shower before he went to work he's got a girlfriend there it's over they draw conclusions from so many things that had no conclusion to be drawn they are determined to prove that this person no longer loves them and they will grab at anything to do that because they're so tormented by the spirit of rejection that they just batter themselves and batter their partner and the relationship is such a mess it's unbearable for both of them and it likely won't last long again unless there's addiction or the one who isn't doing it just shuts them completely out some of the effects of the spirit of rejection are you feel alienated separated and excluded not just from society as a whole but you attach this now to god the church you just know that you don't fit and you long to be accepted and oftentimes when people yield to that longing they end up in trouble because they start making choices at that point that are going too far to get accepted when it could have been done in a healthy way a lot of young girls they will lose their virginity this way because they wanted the acceptance they were put to a test where they had to make a fast decision about that and they made a fast decision they didn't want to lose the relationship and often that comes up later on in years where that really left them divided in themselves and they they knew they were not faithful to themselves and it caused is a serious amount of conflict internally from then on life changes for them because they just threw themselves under the bus and they know that and at that point they know it because they paid a great price you feel like a foreigner and a stranger like you're always looking in the room not in it you have such a belief of this that you will not feel welcome anywhere it is simply because you do not have the option. You will not even give yourself an option to feel welcome, to feel as part of. Definitely not with Christians because you're always placing them in a category of they're better than me. They're doing better than me. They're a better Christian than me. You fall into, you lack hope. You fall into depression, which many do. A lot of times that's fear turned inwards. You exclude yourself even when others are working very hard to include you. Different from me being an introvert where I don't go out much, but I know what that means because I have seen people work very hard to include me back in the days when this was an issue and I didn't believe them. I felt like they were either making fun of me or they were setting a trap for me, something. You just can't take it at face value. You withdraw, you try to do everything alone because that way you won't be rejected. You punish yourself since you do not feel worthy and then that turns into multiple ways of self-harm or making bad decisions intentionally that cause you great harm. You believe I don't deserve anything good and then you apply that also to God's grace for you which again, if you looked in the Bible, you would see that you are believing the opposite of what God writes and that's again a choice. The Bible is again living and active and it will heal you and it will bring you to truth which will defeat the lies that are causing rejection. But if you don't want to read it and you don't want to believe it, you're going to get to keep this mess and you're going to have screwed up relationships your whole life. You will feel more at home in darkness with a bad crowd. This is common. When you start to get really steeped in this rejection, you go to the rest of the people that are in that too. And you hang out in these dark places with people that don't care. Everybody's reckless in their choices, making it's just a mess of what can happen at any given time. And that's what happens when someone is yielding to rejection they start going with people who are not going to look out for them oddly the truth is these people also 
reject you oftentimes, but for some reason you don't think about that. You think they accept you. I hear it all the time. They, they accept me. They're the lower crowd. They're, the, they're that crowd, but they accept me, which is generally not true. You don't have peace. You just have turmoil, fear, and anxiety inside of you. And this will lead you to not settle into a church. You will keep church hopping. You will keep switching jobs. You will keep relocating because you're always looking for that right fit. You go from relationship to relationship, place to place, because you're always looking for the one that fits you and it's gotta be coming up soon because nothing else has worked. It's not gonna be there. You're the problem, not the places. You often fight and argue with people. Disagreement and anger is a normal part of your life. And feeling right is also a normal part of your life. You know you're right. You stand on that. Everyone else needs to come to agreement with you that you are right. And your anger, your jealousy, and your bitterness creates an absolute brick wall between you and any safety of relationships with anyone else. So that kind of behavior makes everyone else shut down. They simply can't manage all the attacks and the anger. So I say for adult people, this is not acceptable behavior. We should never be angry at a person. You can be angry at a choice, but you should never take that anger out on a person. When you are taking it out on a person, you're in the wrong. I don't care how right you think you are, you are in the wrong. You have to be able to somehow manage emotions so that you're not constantly attacking other people, creating expectations for them when they're just trying to go through their life and they can't stay obsessed with you and your feelings. Adult people need to do whatever it takes to not operate in anger, jealousy, bitterness, and constant dissension with other people. Be a good neighbor. This group of people has a really hard time receiving love and gifts. They think they have to work for everything and they think nothing comes for free either. There's always gonna be a hidden motive. This is gonna come back around and it could, but that shouldn't be the filter. That shouldn't be the expectation. We should be able to accept gifts and accept love without painting our suspicion into everything. Some reasons that will cause this kind of behavior in others, some root reasons, because there's always a root reason. Um, people born out of wedlock, believe it or not, can create that rejection where they don't feel like they're wanted or one of the parents didn't necessarily want them. They feel these different things draw these conclusions that maybe aren't even true. They've experienced, someone has experienced a major disease that will cause it because they got put like into a different group of people. Abuse, divorce, sin, crime. Oftentimes when people have done something that has made it the news, I remember um, right before I was saved, I, I was arrested for um, aggravated DUI and I remember and then I was saved shortly after but I remember just begging God for that to not go in the paper I just thought I'm not going to be able to handle that because I just didn't want anybody to know even though I you know pe people know but I was just I couldn't handle that so I I you know it does have a crippling impact when you think like that and of course I've, you know, aged a lot since then and now those things don't matter to me and I don't even look at people based on that. But at the time when it was me, I was terrified of what that was gonna cost me, what people were gonna think of me. Now I'm the one talking about it, but I, I'm very sensitive to people who have suffered public humiliation of any sort, even if they warranted that it's a really hard place to be in. It's tough. And so I have no 
problem befriending people and that's because I still remember how hard that was rejection breeds rebellion but acceptance produces obedience and this is why it's critical that we know what the Bible says about this on every level and sadly because we continue to keep this spirit of rejection and yielding to it and letting it mess up our life people will keep rejecting you and it will keep supporting your belief that people will keep rejecting you and the reason is you have become so hard to be around you are so difficult to deal with because you are so you accuse and you are suspicious and you are paranoid and there's nothing friendly caring and compassionate about you you will end up fulfilling this everywhere you go there's no question that rejection causes very severe suffering it has deep wounds it has wounds that get even deeper more cuts come this goes out in all these different directions it entrenches deep into the memory it changes how we see ourselves it changes our identity it, it, it switches up our relationships with others how we even interact most situations in our life will be affected by this even our relationship with and how we see god most critical it will destroy that too and the bible says that jesus is not a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness in hebrews 4 15 being fully god he chose to be brought low into the humanness of suffering he could not have come in a more low position than he did this is why his own people rejected him as king because he came the lowest he could so that he could identify with us and every part of the life of jesus on earth was touched by rejection jesus faced rejection from his family members the bible says not even his brothers believed in him in john 7 5 jesus own family rejected him as the messiah in his life among us jesus was a son and a brother he had human relationships while he was here on earth that likely hurt him because the love wasn't returned they thought he was crazy because he claimed to be from heaven he wasn't wanted he wasn't accepted he lived a life full of rejection he faced rejection from his community when jesus returned to his hometown of nazareth neighbors that he grew up with and family friends it says took offense at him in matthew 13 57. he said he was without honor in his hometown and the bible says that jesus did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief with him he knows what it's like to not have the love and support of a community or to feel welcome in the place that was his home Jesus faced rejection from people who claimed even to love him. He predicted both Judas' betrayal and Peter's denial. He saw both coming and told them, but he still felt the pain of it. Jesus was troubled in his spirit as he foretold of Judas in John 13, 21. He had just washed Judas' feet, symbolizing the laying down of his very life for him. Peter who was super passionate in how he professed his love and commitment to Jesus more than all the rest, he would reject him just a few short hours later. Jesus felt that too. He looked at him. Jesus faced rejection from his own father. The night of his arrest, Jesus was very sorrowful even to death. Matthew 26, 38. He was in such anguish that he started to sweat blood. Luke 22, 44. And... More than the thoughts of approaching physical pain because Jesus knew what was about to happen. He knew when he left heaven what was going to happen. He knew he was going to be separated from and abandoned by his father. As he hung on the cross dying, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew twenty-seven forty-six. He did not ask, why am I in this much pain or why am I having to endure this? He said, why have you forsaken me? His body's hanging in ribbons, but he was devastated that God had forsaken him in that moment. So 
Jesus more than anyone else, more than any of us, understands the pain of rejection. And then he goes through all of that so that we can be freed from a rejection. And what do we do? We reject him too. We don't want this close relationship with the one who died for us because we want this close relationship with this other person that's standing in front of us that's somehow stimulating more. So Jesus faces rejection continuously because those that he came for, those that he died for, reject him choice by choice by choice by choice, knowing that if Jesus was with me right now, I wouldn't be doing this, which says Jesus is not with them. They know he isn't, or they wouldn't be doing it. If you are sinning sexually, if you are doing something illegal in your job or any other place, and you're thinking you're going to get one up over on Jesus, he's not with you. If you're thinking he doesn't, he's going to let this go. There's so much that we think that we can get away with in this relationship with Jesus, the one who gave all. People have no idea what they're setting themselves up for because this is a marriage and it's one that is symbolized by honor and respect. And anyone who is making choices willfully thinking, if Jesus was standing right here, I wouldn't do this, but they do it. They really don't even know him. They're proving it. When thinking on the death of Jesus and what it did for us, we often overlook what it did to him. His father, with whom he was constantly communicating from eternity past, they were constantly communicating. They had a love that went continuously from one to the other he was suddenly forced to withdraw that love god took it back and turned his back on jesus because of our sin jesus was left alone with all of our sin and separated from god so that we would not have to be and yet many choose to do that Jesus paid it all, and people don't want it. They really do want their sin. We have to realize that Jesus was rejected so that we would not be affected by rejection. However, if God is rejecting what you're saying and doing, you need to take notice of that because if you're operating outside of the will of God, I would repent. I was with my spiritual father this last Saturday night and I said, what do you think of this window we're in? I'm guessing he's about 80. And he's not a man who gives those kinds of opinions really. He doesn't, he's not like watching the clock, so to speak, and talking about the end times. I just said, I'm curious what you think about that. And he said, never has he thought we were in the window until now. He said, we're there. Nothing more needs to happen. He said, this is the first time that he's felt that. My first mentor, when I came up here into ministry, I had asked her this a couple months ago because I was having a different feeling about the times we were in and I knew God was calling us into an assignment that was a critical timing assignment. And I asked her, what's going on? I said, because I'm not one who, who talks about the signs of the times. I really don't spend much time on that. But I asked her what she thought and she said, she's 95 and she has pancreatic cancer. And this would have been about three months ago. She says, I feel that Jesus is going to come before I die. And she's still alive. But she said, that's how close I feel we are. And she was an overseas missionary for most of her life. And she's the probably 
one of the closest people to God I've ever met. Just both of these two are so humble and faith-filled that it meant something to me. I just, I have asked them both. Those are the only two I care to ask because I, I want to know. So I say all of that to say, if you have a chance to repent today, you better take it because we're not looking at too many more chances and God does not owe you even one more. He knows right now you have one and if you don't, he knows you rejected him. That's what he knows. That you love your sin enough to keep holding on to the sin for as long as you can, that's what he knows. In this whole process of deliverance and healing of rejection, we must be completely focused on Jesus Christ and his cross. That's it. Never get focused on the devil's camp. Never get focused on anything else but Jesus and the cross. Because if you do, well, the worst thing that can happen is that nothing happens. The person just stays completely full of devils because nothing happens. Nothing about you has any authority to even challenge them and they just sit in there and laugh at you. That would be the worst thing. As soon as you start to focus on yourself, after you have submitted your life to Christ, if you return back to focusing on self, meeting needs, treating your body like your temple instead of the temple of Jesus, that wall is going to come back up. No one went through more rejection than Jesus, and he did it for a purpose so that we would not be rejected. And the church is so broken now because their priority is no longer how broken Jesus was for our sake. That is generally not what the sermon's about. It's about lots of things. But people do not know the price that was paid for their sin and what is required of them because of that, that if they think they're carrying any sin or love for sin into eternity, they can go, but they will not be going to heaven. No sin kept and no pet sin will allow you entrance to heaven. What surpasses comfort is the knowledge that the gospel stands as an unfaltering, unchangeable answer to rejection. And rejection actually is why the gospel happened in the first place, because sin entered the world because of Adam and Eve. They rejected God and his command. Then they faced God's eternal rejection because they chose to abandon God's way for the same way of the devil, which is I'll do what I want. We are also placed under the curse of separation from his favor and bound to his wrath for the same reason, because they turned us away from that, but we do it too, all the time. We can't blame Adam and Eve. We do it too. Given the chance to honor and love and adore Jesus, we still keep doing the same. But Jesus redeemed us from that curse by taking it upon himself. And to redeem means you buy back, accept, and choose and that is the opposite of rejection and by the power of the gospel we have received the spirit of adoption according to Romans 8 15 and that's a permanent and binding acceptance and we know that nothing can separate us from the father's love according to Romans 8 38 through 39 I hear that verse oftentimes when people say you can never lose your salvation that is not, nothing can separate you from God's love, but you yourself can walk away from him. So that doesn't mean you can go out and do whatever you want and God's love will not leave you. God's love will not leave you, but you left the kingdom. Just know you can do that. Man's rejection is made so small in light of the truth that through the gospel, we have God's eternal, unconditional love and acceptance. And so what can man's rejection do? It's if God is for us, who can be against us? And this again is why you need to, you have got to know what the Bible says because otherwise if the world is your teacher, there's no way 
that you will be able to walk this out. You cannot be a believer and not be in the Bible. You cannot be a Christian and not be in your Bible. I know people say this all the time. I don't read the Bible. You're not going to heaven. I'm just going to say it. If you don't, if you're not in the Bible, that's the only way to know God. You're rejecting food for that relationship. So if you are truly his, you love your Bible. John 10, 10 tells us, that these oppressive spirits from the enemy come to steal, kill, and destroy. So we must ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the root cause of this spirit. There's going to be more than that, but this one is a really bad one, and it really changes your life. The Holy Spirit will help you. This is what we do as a ministry. So we are able to help you. You're always welcome to reach out to us. Even if you're not local, we can we can certainly work with you by phone. We do not charge. Um, but you need to know, you, we need to break the back of that rejection. And we'll help you find the door. You need to repent of the areas and times that you have believed that the spirit of rejection and the orphan spirit was true over the spirit of sonship that is given to you by God. When you choose to defer and obey rejection and the orphan spirit, abandonment, fear. You're rejecting what God has given you as a gift of sonship. Take each thought captive and the Holy Spirit is will do the heavy lifting on that if you will work with him. You need to renounce Every single lie that comes through your head, you need to break agreements with it, repent of it, renounce it, put it down. Don't ruminate on it. Don't even try to think if it's true. It doesn't even matter. Kick it out. Writing down Bible verses on paper and carrying them around and just, or MP3 players just filled with promises. Tati has many, many things recorded on her. The Perch on her Seven Bells Refuge YouTube channel where you can just listen to the word. You can listen to promises. You can listen to these things and go into your brain and heal your mind. Declare your identity in Christ. Know it and say it. And know it and say it and walk in it. And keep saying it. If you do not know your identity in Christ, you will develop your own identity. And that one, if it's not in Christ, is not going with him. You don't get the option of keeping your own identity and being a Christian. You are either in Christ, you denied self, you crucified self, you no longer yield to self. You live for Jesus. That's the only option you have. Stay in the word. Spend time with God, fill your mind with who he says you are, and thank him for all he's done because he has done far more than what would ever be required, far more than any person I've ever met would do. And people think he's a harsh God. Well, no, if there's a certain system and people think it's harsh, don't forget he paved the way to make you not have to take the penalty. He also came forward and took your sentence for you. So you can't stand in front of him and call him harsh, judgmental, mean. He did everything for you. He made this completely free for you. So you're going to look incredibly selfish to stand there and judge God when you meet him. When he shows you Jesus' hands will have holes in them. You only needed to accept a free pass into heaven and you rejected it because you chose to judge God. The spirit of sonship is battling for you against the spirit of rejection and the orphan spirit and you are the one who decides who wins. Each person will choose whether they accept the spirit of sonship for their identity or whether they walk in the identity of rejection. Every person's life will show which one they chose. It's not hard to tell. 
Those who walk in sonship have the peace of God that passes all understanding. They, they're a joy to be around each other. They're fulfilling the great commandment to go and love God, love others. Those who choose the spirit of rejection are going to be battling the rest of us out here. They're just going to battle and battle and battle and battle. Which one will you choose? In the comments, I'm going to put several resources because there's just so much more to this topic. So in the comments, I'm going to put, first of all, um, prayers to address the spirit of rejection in you. Feel free to reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to help also. And I'm also going to, there's a couple PDF books that I'm going to put that will also give great help to you. So I know this is a big subject, so I'm going to put a lot more help in the comments. Precious Lord, this was the this was the destructive force in my life, and I am so grateful that you paved not you not only paid for me to be free, but you also evicted this spirit from my life along with everything else that was working with it. I never even imagined being who I am today because walking with the Holy Spirit is so different from walking with all of what I had. Thank you for healing all of the things you have healed and I ask you to continue to bring healing to me and I ask that you would help us to be bright lights for you in all of these areas that we will be proof that you are a healer, that you are so you are no respecter of persons. You pick the lowest. And we get to watch this all the time that you are coming into places where people never expect you to show up. That's where you're walking. We're, we just marvel at being able to be part of this work with you. And we ask that you would help us to be the best we can be completely fixated on you. We do choose to lay down self and ask that you keep helping us. And we bless all of those that are listening. And I ask God that you would heal them in Jesus' name. We curse the spirit of rejection, the orphan spirit, spirit of fear, fear of rejection, fear of man, pride. We curse them and ask Holy Spirit that you would go in, evict them and take up your residence and change people, heal them. In Jesus' name, amen.